Order. And the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions. The Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure, and we will start with listed questions. Question one has been withdrawn. I call Ms. Megan Ferran. Question two. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for a question. Females are significantly underrepresented in sports comparison to males. And to help address this problem, Sports Matters Day Call Strategy for Sport contains a specific target to deliver a 6% increase in women's participation rates by 2019. So to ensure this target is achieved, a published Sports Matters Action Plan contains actions embracing a range of organisations across the sport and leisure sector. These include promoting increased female participation through a series of departmental investments and encouraging other parties such as councils and government bodies as examples to do likewise. In particular, Sport NI's investment programmes such as Active Communities, Awards for Sport, Active Clubs, to name but a few, include targets to increase girls' and women's participation in sport. The most recent progress report shows that the 2012-2013 Continuous Household Survey records of female participation in sport has increased to 41 per cent, and that's an increase of 16 per cent, putting the target on the strategy on track. But, with the, but I still hold the view that we have still much work to do. Thank you. Ms. Ferran for a supplementary. You mentioned some organisations and, uh, and bodies. Can the Minister outline how these organisations are helping with the delivery of the um, Sports Matters target to increase female participation in sport? Thank the member for supplementary. Uh, some of the bodies include district councils who are involved in the delivery of active communities programme. The Ulster Council of GAA is also delivered, delivering on a number of programmes such as Gillick for Mothers, Recreational Games for Adults, Habitable Games and Coaching Development Workshops. The IFA has also done excellent work, at, particularly on the expansion of junior girls' leagues and the growth of women's senior leagues. It has held open days to introduce girls to soccer and delivered a SCORE pilot project that provides clubs with tools to enable them to encourage more girls into the sport. Ulster Rugby, through its Women's Development Officer, has delivered a number of programmes, including the Play Rugby Girls Initiative and the, Gir the Girls Schools Cups. And Sport and I is also working with a number of governing bodies of sport to support the development of female sports forum. Thank you. Ms. McLevin. Speaker, the Commission on the Future of Women's Sport in the UK reported last year that only one in five members of the boards of national governing bodies is a woman and a quarter of sports have no women in those board positions. Can I ask the Minister what role she feels that she can play to encourage governing bodies in Northern Ireland to recruit more women or in some instances a woman um, to their boards and would she also agree that this would also help to assist to increase the number of women participating in sport? I absolutely agree with the member. Um, Maybe it wasn't that report, but certainly seen similar reports. And I actually heard a programme on the radio one night uh, talking about just this very thing. I think it, it's totally unacceptable that governing bodies, you know, in 2014 don't have any women on their, on their boards. And certainly, despite some of the programmes that they offer, there needs to be a bit more thought put in about how they're actually going to attract more women and more girls to the sport. I will monitor this through the Sports Monitoring Implementation Group, which has representation of the governing bodies on it, and will continue to question it. I think what some of the governing bodies have done has been very good, but others need to follow their example. And certainly the promotion and, uh, I suppose, you know, congratulating the, the female athletes, but also the women who are coming behind them, actually doing more to raise awareness around young women and girls in sport is something that we all have responsibility for, but they certainly need to do more work on it. I call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister of Sport NI has any plans to increase opportunities for young females or indeed women uh, in rural areas to get involved in sport? Absolutely. Um, I mean, part of the, the, the we were talking about this earlier at a different debate about promoting equality and tackling poverty and promoting social inclusion. Certainly, in terms of money, when I just three governing bodies with a particular emphasis not only on just deprivation but real isolation. Uh, some of the governing bodies, uh, not all, actually have uh, branches and leagues within rural communities. Uh, they need to make sure that they, if, if they've got levels of young girls and women involved in their sport now, they need to make sure that they're not selling for that. They need to go out and make sure this figure is increased. And I'd certainly, as I said to the chair of the CAL committee, we'd be raising this with the governing bodies and also raising it with the sports when I meet them, which I do on a regular basis. 
Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and, uh, and uh, to lead on in an earlier thread, role models are very important uh, in encouraging more female uh, participation in sport. Uh, I wonder has the Minister been proactive in, in trying to get more television coverage for female sports, and if she has, can she detail what, that, what she's been doing? Well, certainly I've reminded uh, some of the media that when they're, um, they're covering some of the sports events, and particularly covering some of the, covering some of the events that involve women, albeit so, so few, that they need to do more of it because there's plenty of good news stories out there involving young women and, uh, and women and girls in sport. Uh, I've actually met uh, broadcasters or met uh, television companies and uh, media providers on a range of issues primarily for broadcasting, but I've raised this. And not just raise this, but raise the fact that there's so many, so much good work out there, so much good work out there involving communities, including arts, sports, and culture. That perhaps we should look at a way of profiling that, and I'd be happy to assist in doing that. Call Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. Gourmet August, question number three. I thank the member for her question and indeed her, her consistent support for mental health promotion. Uh, I recognise the value and the valuable contribution that culture, arts and leisure can make in improving health and combating depression and anxiety and in the worst case, for, as we know, that has led and has the, the, the potential to lead to self-harm and suicide and so therefore decal our support in a number of initiatives. These include the IFA Health Programme which has received uh, over £500,000, Sport and I Mind in Your Head Awareness Programme which has so far received £42,000. Libraries and I have done an excellent job in terms of Health and Mind programme, which received around a million pounds from the Big Lottery Fund. And indeed, the Arts Council uh, have invested £200,000 into a youth arts strategy, particularly around pilot initiatives aimed at young people who are at risk of poor mental health. Um, and also, uh, a small pilot programme of £30,000 for two projects that to look at how suicide awareness can be conveyed to sports groups and community groups. Ms. Maeve McLaughlin for a supplementary. Gurma, I would pray last young caller and I thank the Minister for her response and detailed response. Can I ask the Minister specifically in terms of the suicide awareness prevention programmes and you have detailed a number of them. Um, Will they be rolled out across the entire north, including FOIL? And does she intend to work directly with the, the Health Minister in relation to particularly suicide prevention and addiction issues in the FOIL area? Uh, well, I am working with the Health Minister and other ministers, um, and particularly around the, the promotion of better mental health. I mean, it is a strap line, but it's one that we have taken very seriously. Suicide is everybody's business. So we're part of the Ministerial Subcommittee on Suicide Prevention and Better Mental Health Provision and I can assure the, the member that DECAL has taken forward pilot programmes which do seek to increase the awareness of issues around poor mental health and suicide prevention uh, as I mentioned uh, in the primary answer primarily within sports clubs. Uh, this programme at the minute is currently um, one group in Belfast and Neve Louise as a charity looking after rural communities. Um, the post project evaluation will take place with a view of extending it across. Uh, DECAL are also working with DART to ensure that suicide prevention and mental health uh, promotion, better health promotion happens within the rural community. And indeed, uh, DART have been very proactive, as has the Department of Health, uh, around libraries initiatives, particularly around providing the 10 Safe Talk suicide prevention programmes, which are in Santalo and within the full constituency. And just to assure the member, I mean, I think it's, I speak on behalf of the ministers that I mentioned and those that I haven't. I, I don't think we're done yet. We're actively looking at ways in which we can provide a cross-departmental approach to a very, very serious issue. Well, Mr. Gregory Campbell. Uh, it's undoubtedly the case that there will be widespread support for such a move, but can the minister indicate if any thought has been given to ensuring that uh, a, a champion of people with mental health issues can be brought forward to help promote those uh, issues t in terms of leisure pursuits and active sports participation uh, in that category. I thank the member for his question and we are actively looking champions. At the minute we have one for boxing, we're looking at some for soccer, we're looking at some for GEA and rugby and also for England. I mean, there are a number of sports personalities who have been very, very proactive. I'm very genuine in their support around this issue. They're quite happy to give of their time. 
So at the minute we're looking at that to see how we can best use that. Already we have Carl Frampton and Paddy Barnes in North Belfast, uh, two boxers who have went along with the strap line of we've got your back, we've got your corner. They've done some very, very good work and we aim to build on that. And not just to have it in Belfast, but to roll out across the north where possible. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Prince, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Maybe, Minister, could I ask you to elaborate on um, particularly the programmes that aim to re engage or disaffected young people with mental health problems? Well, Dee Call are working with a number of sports bodies, but we're also working with arts organisations and working across the community, particularly in terms of neighbourhood renewal agencies or areas, as well as that working with libraries and, and groups across the rural community. I'm hoping to provide, either through creative industries, uh, through libraries, through sports, through government bodies, opportunities that when we're looking at child protection and safeguarding issues, that we build in good mental health awareness around that as well. Because more often than not, particularly for young men, the evidence thus far is that if the talk and when the talk, they normally talk to their peers within schools or within the sports clubs, mostly within the sports clubs. So we aim to try and help prepare the sports providers and coaches to cope with people who are presenting, sometimes in crisis. I call Mr Roy Biggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister advise how uh, she has adapted programmes within her department following on from the Bamford Review into mental health? Well, the, the Bamford Review in mental health, um, particularly around suicide prevention and particularly looking at people, Bamford looked at inequalities in people with disabilities, which itself is an, uh, an issue of equality. And we're taking a cross-departmental approach. So the Minister for Health and Public Safety is leading on the ministerial subcommittee, which we're all, uh, most of us are, are involved in, actively involved in, looking at programmes that we can all support each other's work in. But to make sure that, first of all, it's a programme that's relevant, that it's based within government policy, and if it's not, to make sure that it is based within government policy, and it is a very, very proactive subcommittee. Um, but in terms of Bamford, although it's not my sole purpose, I'm aware of Bamford, I'm aware of my responsibilities to Bamford, and indeed I'm sure the member heard the debate that we had earlier on about facilities for people with disabilities and special needs. All we have to do, without even putting titles on it, is implement Section 75. Thank you. And I call Mr David McNary. Question number four. Thank the member for his question. Poetry is promoted by DECAL in a variety of ways through a range of DECAL and our arms length bodies. And in 2013, a number of specific projects featuring poetry and other forms of literature took, part as par took place as part of the city of culture. The Arts Council, through its annual programme, funds Poetry Ireland and the Verbal Arts Centre, poetry being part of its remit. The Brussels platform is a collaboration between Arts Council and the Office of the Executive in Brussels, which involves local artists showcasing their talents in the city and indeed in European parliaments. Internationally acclaimed poet Paul Muldoon is the latest in the homegrown talent to represent the arts as part of this initiative, and also the first ever Belfast poet laureate, Dr Sinead Morrissey, was the recipient of an Arts Council major, major individual award in 2012. As a member knows, Sinead went on to win the T.S. Eliot Prize for Poetry, um, this year, also, Nathaniel Joseph Macaulay, a Belfast-based poet, and Matt Kirkham, a County Down-based poet, are in receipt of awards on the Artist Career Enhancement Scheme. Promoting and providing access to poetry is a key component of the, the Library's strategy, and indeed, Public Records Office also hosted poetry evenings as well. Nari for supplementary, possibly in rhyme. I, I do thank the, the, the Minister for a comprehensive answer. Can I say we talk uh, in here sometimes in anger, sometimes in jest, each attempting no matter to give our very best. Budgets, flags, parades, we trot them out one by one, and only recently, Minister, we hovered on the brink over those on the run. So, Minister, my supplementary is quite unconditional. Will you recognise that poetry is traditional? Have you got the money to fund this expression, or will you let it float away in another depression? <laughs> and you didn't rap? <laughs> 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 
I could have done the bass drums for you at the back. Fair play to you. Um, I have to say that's probably one of the best exchanges that we've ever, ever had. And you and I have a long history, come back to 2007, and we'll say no more. Um, but but um, the member's point is right. We, we, need a, we, need, we need to fund poetry. We have many, we have a great history and a heritage of poetry in the north. We've recently marked the, the very sad passing of Seamus Heaney amongst mentioning others, we've got Sinead Morrissey and others that I just mentioned there, and we need to support them. And I've no doubt that they will be exemplars for other poets, budding poets in all places, including this House, who need to come forward. So thank you very much. I call Sean Lynch to beat that. Gurumayogat, the last call and call you. Home Greek is and I want to thank the Minister for her answer. Is the Minister able to provide details on what other projects does the Arts Council support to promote poetry? Gurumayogat. I felt sorry for Sean there having to ask a supplementary after such colour from the back benches from David. Um, but in fairness to him, the Arts Council have done a lot to promote poetry. The Irish Pages in the New York uh, was established and emerged for, for emerging poets biannually, uh, and it's a grant of almost £30,000 has been awarded for the years 2014 and 15. The Abridged, a magazine of poetry and photography, publishes entirely uh, new work from established and emerging poets uh, periodically. The Honest Ulsterman publishes new poetry for more, well, over 30 years. Uh, and is uh, being revived this year by the Verbal Arts Centre with the new editor. Poetry Ireland um, also receives Arts, po Arts Council support and Poetry in Motion, uh, and that's looking at you know, poetry and poets and schools initiative. So the Arts Council have done quite a lot around the promotion of poetry, and like some of the, of the rest of the family in DECAL are quite anxious and quite eager to find out what else what we can do to try and make sure that there's a better promotion and better investment in poetry. Mr. Dominic Bradley. Good morning, my good friend. of last call you. I the Oaris and the Gaelic. Ogus Boylam se ifri denara and and meshi sasta and kesha a hogal egan kid krinuella den ko aracht. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for her answers. I'm sure that she'll be aware that one of the main vehicles for the publication of poetry in Irish in Ulster is Antultak. Uh, a 90 year old uh, magazine. Uh, recently, Forest and the Gaelic has ceased funding this magazine, and uh, I would like to ask the Minister if she will challenge this decision at the uh, next meeting of the North South Ministerial Council in language format. Thank the member for his question. I'll certainly be raising the issue of Until Talk at the next NSMC, and I would also ask the Raymond, who probably raised a question with a member who's been on the radio, to ask for a meeting with Forrest Nagilga, because my understanding when I last queried this, there hasn't even been a meeting sought with Forrest Nagilga to raise objections about this, uh, which is questionable, but also even in terms of to look at new ways in which this publication can be sustained, in terms of the new core funding arrangements. So certainly I'd be raising it, but I would also advise the people and in Toltak to certainly go to Forst and Agilga as a first stop, rather than, rather than um, asking for support without even good threat. Because when people come genuinely to query why the support is ceasing in its current configuration, one of the, the next question says, and who have you spoken to? So not to speak to anybody who's leaving them fairly wide open, in my opinion, but I'd certainly be happy to raise it. Thank you. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Question number five, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for his question. And up to £580 per person is available to the application for the Gale Talk Bursary Scheme. 
One of the key priorities for the Gale Top Bursary Scheme is to contribute to tackling poverty and social exclusion. The Gale Top Bursary Scheme aims to give eligible applicants on low incomes an opportunity to attend intensive Irish language courses that are held in the Donegal Gale Top during the summer. The intensive nature of these courses helps learners to develop their speaking and listening skills. This year, at least 100 places are available on the scheme, and I would encourage uh, eligible applicants to apply before the closing date of the 4th of April. I call Mr. Joe Byrne. I thank the Minister for her answer. It's comprehensive. Can, would the Minister agree that the Irish Celtic colleges do provide excellent facilities for young people in the summer time? And what plans is there to increase the funding? And does she intend having some liaison with the Education Minister to try and expand the scheme? Well, in terms of, I would agree with the member in terms of the value that the scheme has provided, particularly for children who come from families with very low incomes. Um, I mean, as a, as a person myself who went to the Gale Talk recently as part of FLIFA, I, I uh, can see firsthand the, the value of an intensive Irish court in, term, in terms of helping your speaking and listening skills. I haven't went to any other minister with this yet. Um, because at the end of the day, this is, a, this is a language development scheme, which is really pr the primary responsible for DECAL. But I've certainly spoken to some of the sports governing bodies and certainly spoken to some of the other providers about maybe extending the Gale Talk Bursary Scheme to try and make sure that we get as maximum numbers as possible, because it, it is really an invaluable experience. Ms. Rosalind McCorley. I got a pre last con call your school boys lessonara as up to Fredrick. Um and future lessonara Kershia Sieni or in Critter and Kylie Acta done done schemes bar and after the Gale Tukta. Um can the minister outline please what's the eligibility criteria for the Gale Tuck bursary scheme, Gurma Yogurt? Um I thank the member for supplementary. The the bursary scheme as I mentioned is open to individuals for and well primarily primarily who have been signed up to Leafa but particularly those who are on low incomes. Um, for the applicant or the applicant's children who are in receipt of free screen meals as provided, approved by local education library board, pension credits, income support, income-based job seekers allowance, income-related employment and support allowance, uh, the guarantee element of the state pension credit and support under the Immigration and Asylum Act. Um, I mean, that is an example of the criteria that's laid out for people who feel that they may apply uh, or they, they may be eligible to apply for the Leaf of Bursary Scheme. And I call Mr Jonathan Craig. Thank you much. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, question six. Thank the member for his question. And Salto has been a real success story in the field of gymnastics. Since hosting the training camp for the Chinese Artistic Gymnastics Olympic teams, I understand that there is now a long waiting list of people wanting to join the club and there is a real need to increase the capacity. I have seen that myself when I visited the club. The member is also aware that I have had a very useful meeting with him and the, the Chief Executive of Salto uh, last November to discuss the expansion plans for their facilities. So I know that Salto has engaged with Sport NI and is looking to receive their support from their technical unit with regard to feasibility uh, of the proposed extension. And Sport NI is currently working with Salto to develop a business case. Although Salto has not yet applied for any recent grants from Sport and either capital programme, I understand that probably after going through all the technical work that they need to do, they will do in the near future. And Mr. Craig, for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that answer. And indeed, they are not only what I would call a local success, a massive success in the gymnastics field. I would say they are actually a regional, if not UK-wide, success in that field. There is over 800 on the waiting list, Minister, as was discussed at the meeting. It, it is imperative that they get the expansion that they require. Um, will the Minister give this House an assurance that she will do everything in her power to find the funding for that expansion? Well, the member knows that I'm supportive of SALTO, but SALTO, like any other group of plan for that fund, has to go through due process, so it's totally inappropriate, despite my support for SALTO, to say that I'm going to find them the money. You know, it's just totally inappropriate, but the member will appreciate that I have been very supportive of SALTO. I have visited the, the, the gym on several occasions. I've no doubt I'll be back again in the future, and I wish them well in their successful uh, endeavours and wish them well in their application. 
Before I, I call any supplementary, any further supplementaries, can I just point out that uh, this is a constituency-specific question. Uh, there are a number of other such questions on the list today. I see. <laughs> Could I ask the Minister, a recent Audit Office report actually highlighted some shortcomings of, within Sports NI in terms of major capital funding. Uh, how is the Minister putting in place any uh, procedures to make sure these are not repeated? I thank the Member for a supplementary, and as a member of the CAL Committee, he would have certainly had side off, if not been familiar with all the details from the recent Audit Report. Um, which was critical of Sport NI's handling of, major, of a major capital programme or project. My department has been assured by the Sport NI accountant officer that this, um, that this is implementing and rec the recommendations of the report and applying the lessons learnt. Sport NI has an established track record of delivering quality sports facilities at community level and delivering these with appropriate project management practices. Significant changes have been made in Sport NI as a result of the government's review since the project, the St. Clemens project was taken forward, and I can assure the member that this will be the, uh, this will be the rule rather than the exception from here on in. <laughs> I will call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number seven, please. The health and long term sustainability of the Loch Ness fishery is a key priority for my department. The status of fish stocks is virtually or vitally important, and I have commissioned the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, AFBI, to extend our research programme throughout the catchment. There is a significant body of data on the Atlantic salmon as a result of our commitments to the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organisation. The salmon population across the North has been in decline, and I have recently introduced new conservation legislation to protect salmon stocks. The European eel stock is also in decline, and to comply with the EU requirements, we have developed an eel management plan for the lock, sorry, for the Ney ban catchment. The implementation of the plan, the associated Elver restocking programme, is contributing to the achievement of all these targets. Mr. Agnew, for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, has the Minister and her department, through the various research uh, that has been carried out, um, been able to ascertain any cause for the depletion in some of the, 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 the fish stocks in the lock? There, there are a number of factors, and uh, I'm really reluctant just to point out one because it looks like the one that you point out is the main problem. There are, are a number of factors, uh, including, I would add, global warming. I would also add pollution. I would add domestic pollution, commercial pollution. Over, over fishing. I would also, ask, or I would also uh, suggest that perhaps a lack of respect for the locks and riverways is also leading and not maintaining sustaining the riverbeds to encourage better growth of fish stocks is a reason, and there are many, many more. Um, and I am relying on the AFBE report to bring forward not only just the costs but specific recommendations that not only Europe has asked us to comply with, but I personally want to make sure that they are implemented to make sure the stocks not only are maintained, but to grow. I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Can, can I ask the Minister, can, can the Minister outline the rationale behind DECAL's development of a fishery management plan for Loch Ness? Well, as I said to the member, I mean, there have been a range of pressures on Loch Ness, just as an example, and the catchment based fisheries management plan is key to ensuring that all fish stocks and habitats are, are managed and developed responsibly. This will help the full potential of the fishery and it will benefit the local communities around the Loch Shore, the local economy and the ecology, the ecology of the Loch, which is really a primary concern for, for many people. The plan will also take into, concert, <coughs> into account and complement existing initiatives such as the EU aid management plan and also look at other statutory and regulatory requirements such as the Water Framework Directive. The, the, the fishery management plans will also be underpinned by robust scientific evidence, and that's why it's really important that the fishery management plan for Loch Ness is robust as possible, not just to look at the fish stocks, but also as a growing and vital, uh, vital to the local economy. Thank you. And, uh, that ends the period for uh, oral questions, and we will now move on to topical questions. And question one has been withdrawn within the appropriate time frame, and I call Mr. William Humphrey. 
you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the House will be aware of the Minister's personal commitment to the LIFA project. Can I ask the Minister um, the expenditure from her department on the project, including the current advertising campaign, and what is the equivalent similar new and additional initiative she would sponsor for Ulster Scots? Sorry, your members talking about LIFA? Okay. Um, well, I can get, I get the member the up-to-date figures um, as of this week they'll, they'll have changed. Um, I have consistently asked the Ulster Scots Agency and indeed the Ministerial Advisory Group in Ulster Scots to bring forward similar programmes because I think it adds added value to what they're doing already. I'm waiting on those programmes and have been waiting on those programmes from September 2011. So what I would ask a member to use whatever influence and encouragement he has because it's really, really important that people from the Ulster Scots community see not only ministerial support but also ministerial investment in those initiatives. I call Mr Humphrey for supplementary. I thank the Minister for a reply. Can I, can I have an assurance from the Minister that if a project is brought forward an equivalent to uh, the LIFA project uh, for the Irish language community here in Northern Ireland, whether it be language, history or culture for the Ulster Scots community across Ulster, it will have full support and be resourced in terms of money and people. Well, I, I have already spoken to people from the Ulster Scots community, and I appreciate that in terms of the pressures around language, it's not the same. We're comparing spuds and apples here. But what we do need to do is look at culture and heritage, which is very, very important. And so many times, so many times, I have offered my support, and I have encouraged initiatives to come forward. And I'm still, that door is still open. I'm still waiting on projects being brought forward. And I can assure the member and other members have an interest here, that when they're brought forward, I'll have a look at them with a the view of giving them full support. Thank you. And I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister for an update on the rollout of the £3 million funding for boxing clubs across Northern Ireland? Well, I'll give the member um, a written response to that, but the update is this, that there's, almost, there's well over £12 million of the needs, because boxing has been left in such a sorry state for decades. It's going to take £12 million and then some to have boxing brought, facilities brought into the 21st century. The clubs who needed the most got first. Most within the boxing community understand that or going through a process of getting themselves project ready with a view of I'm trying to get more money in. I'm also trying to work with some of the local governments. So they uh, bring forward some support as Belfast City Council thus far has been the only local government to do so. So I'm really supportive of boxing, as a member knows, and really keen to make sure there's more money invested because the, the, the sport needs it. Anderson for a supplementary. Thank, you. I thank the minister for that response, and I note our comments regarding the sorry state that, that boxing was in for decades. But uh, the minister should be aware that there are serious concerns within the boxing fraternity about how this money is being distributed. How does the minister respond to the assertions that funding targeted for boxing is being fu uh, used to fund GAA clubs? Much, very much to the anger of those boxing clubs. I, well, I'm delighted that the GA has a staunch support in the DUP, so far play to you, Sydney. But, and certainly, certainly in terms of, though I understand the members holding up the Sunday World article, which I think is um, untrue, okay, for the respect and parliamentary language. I don't support money going to the GAA that's earmarked for boxing, that has to go straight for boxing facilities, and I don't think it's happened in that case. And I want to see the outcome of questions that I've raised in sport and I regarding that. But I can assure the member and other members that the money is earmarked for boxing and boxing alone. It's not earmarked for GA or any other sport. I call Mr John Dallet. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, on a much happier note, the Minister will know that up in the North West we're still revelling from the success of the City of Culture. But the House will also know that in more recent weeks a young girl called Rachel O'Connor from from Cern Limavady has charmed millions of people across these islands. Has the Minister plans to invest in the obvious culture and arts that exist, not just in the city, but well beyond it? Thank the member for a supplementary. And the, the member will also know that I'm a recent and frequent visitor, both in Limavady, Dungiven, Coleraine, um, not just the city of Derry. And I appreciate the cultural fabric and the rich cultural fabric that the city and surrounding communities have. I, as part of the legacy of the city culture, I am investing and making sure that, as well as for this year, we're looking at 
you know, uh, festivals, certainly in the Mavadi, we're looking at sports facilities in Dungiven, we're looking at sports facilities in Coleraine, but we're not done yet. So we're looking at what we can do this year with the view of rolling it out into next year and the years after that. Mr. Dallet for supplementer. Uh, the Minister has certainly focused on sport, but she will, of course, realise that Rachel's performances on, on The Voice indicated that there's more than sport in the North West. So could I press her further and ask, has the cultural aspect of it been addressed? Well, the cultural aspect has been addressed and will be, continue to be addressed, and it is about supporting young uh, artists like Rachel. Um, I mean, it is a city, I've said it before, it is a city that sings, but it's a region that sings. And not only in terms of singing, but certainly we had uh, a harp school, the Roy Dahl harp, harp School up in Long Gallery last week. I've met other harp, harp schools, I've met festival providers, um, and certainly young, young groups who are coming together with through pop music, also met piping groups, marching bands, and traditional, Irish traditional groups. So, you have a, you have a, good, cultural, a good cultural thread out there, and apparently it all emanates from the word Kilian, which starts in, in most, most uh, communities, but certainly I have, I think, been a good advocate for the City of Culture last year. I will continue to be a strong advocate this year and the years after, and that includes the whole of North West, not just the City of Derry. Thank you. And it comes to Gregory Campbell. On the boxing issue, can the Minister outline if the extent of uh, professional fees and project management fees in relation to that amount of funding is similar, greater or less than in other areas? Well, the, I need to get a breakdown of exactly what the professional fees were, and I expect that to come in the, the queries that I've raised as a result of an article in a paper on Sunday. But my understanding, and the reason why we invested in making sure that there was good technical appraisals of the, the, the needs was we need to get structural engineers and to do an independent assessment of how bad or how poor the boxing clubs were. They were very busy. The conditions are well below fit for purpose. Um, to the shame of mis myself, and it should be the shame of not only previous DECON ministers, but certainly local government. They have let the boxing community down disgracefully. So if it means standing, spending that money to stand the boxing community in good stead, then I'm prepared to do it. Mr Campbell for supplementary. Just uh, on the issue of the, the minister saying she's going to examine that and the uh, newspaper report, uh, will it be the case that she will, uh, as she has said, stand up for boxing, try to ensure that there is the appropriate level of funding to ensure it comes into the 21st century, and then take steps to correct what she says was the inaccurate information contained in the newspaper report? Absolutely, because I think that, um, particularly when it comes to boxing, there has been in the past, and certainly in the recent past, inaccurate stories in relation to what is happening within the boxing family and the boxing community. But, you know, the member can accept what I'm saying here today and other members in this House. I'm not funding, I'm not using the boxing money as a, as a way of getting money to the GA. It's not what it's about. This is money to go to boxing, to look at boxing facilities, capital investment. Uh, it isn't money for any other sport. All those other sports are entitled and have a right to come and ask like anybody else. It's money for boxing. So I will correct the the, the story in the paper, and I will ensure and assure the member that not only will I give him a detailed account and breakdown of how that money was spent, but let me say I already know that the money has done a good assessment on the needs of the club, which have already de provided details that we, we need at least £12 million to correct the shoddy conditions that our boxing community, the sport that yields us most medals than any other sport, are now training in. It's disgraceful. And it comes to Raymond McCartney. I'm very and very mindful of the tone of John Dowd's question and the fact that the Minister acknowledged Derry as a city of song. I was tempted to perhaps sing this question, but I'll spare everybody it. Okay. But can I ask the Minister in relation to the Foyle, Galley, the Foyle Valley Gateway project to give us an update on the sort of legacy funding for that particular project? These are in good form a day. Um, Foy Valley Gateway program, <laughs> as a member knows, has received uh, well at least two million pounds from DECAL. 
Uh, that is part of an overall program which I know uh, have also applied to the Social Investment Fund and indeed Derry City Council. That is one aspect of the Daisy Fields and the Showgrounds which is indeed part of an overall program for the Brandywell. Well, and without prompting the members' next question, I'm assuming that's where this is going. But certainly, we've put some investment in, but we're not done yet. McCartney for his anticipated supplementary. I, I thought you were going to say there for an encore, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just take a supplementary. Uh, in relation to it, and the minister has, has sort of anticipated the question because I think it's important that perhaps we do get some sort of detail, uh, particularly around sports development and what sort of funding can the minister expect to bring to the North West, and I mean the North West. Well, the, I've given an answer in terms of the, the Daisy Fields and the Showgrounds, and I appreciate that that's part of a wider programme, which will be available you know, um, from 2015 and beyond. Uh, I've already asked uh, Derry City Football Club, and I know they'll do this, to talk to the IFA about sub-regional development. As well as this, the, the North West, I'm looking at a, a centre of sport and inclusion in Dungiven and looking for the, a multi-sports uh, facility in the areas of Coleraine, looking at somehow developing creative hubs and a language hub within Straban. And certainly, we're not done yet, but we are looking at the entire North West. And I'm absolutely delighted the member didn't sing poetry and one day was enough, albeit done beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. And I call Mr. Alistair Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that this morning uh, the news carried a story about a number of Northern Ireland artefacts, uh, many of which cost millions of pounds to be dug up from the ground, which are being stored in, in bags and, and boxes across the province. Can the Minister comment on the current uh, provision of adequate storage facilities across Northern Ireland for such artefacts? Well, the Member will be aware that um, I mean, this is. Uh, within the Department of the Environment, it's PPS, PPS 6, I think. But irrespective of that, uh, I mean, a number of private developers that during the boom years had a responsibility for excavation, and as a result of that, um, discovered what they thought were artefacts, and they may certainly turn out to be artefacts, and the conditions in which they seem to be stored are far from satisfactory. The role of decal via the museums is an advisory role, but certainly I think we need to look at the long-term uh, I suppose sustainability around artefacts, how they're displayed, actually how they're dealt with displayed um, is something that I believe the story was hinting at this morning. But I, I'll be waiting on a report coming from that. Uh, but as I said, decal's role is purely an advisory at this stage. Ross for supplementary. Thank you. And when the Minister refers to waiting on a report, can she give us any more details on who that report is from, who it will be uh, addressed to? and what potential actions that, that she would envisage taking to ensure that we do, if we do have artefacts of, of particular interest to, to Northern Ireland, that they are uh, stored and presented in, a, in a, a fashion that will be of interest to the public? Well, the report I'd be asking for is really what people think decal's role is and what decal's role should be. Let's be frank about that. I'm not going out looking for work. I have enough work to be dealing with, and with very little money to be doing it. So I'm quite happy to let Mark H. Sturkin do the work he can with advice from museums. But certainly I'd be contesting some of the accusations or certainly some of the assertions made about decal's role in preservation. Uh, happy for the museums to still to be used in terms of their advisory and their functionary role around advice and their preservation. And that's where it starts and ends. And Mr Chris Hazard is not in this place. Mr Tom Elliott is not in this place. So I call Mr Alec Maskey. Can I first of all uh, commend the Minister for being the first and only Minister in these institutions over a long number of years who has become a champion on behalf of the amateur boxing fraternity, a much needed uh, sport and very strong community. And on that basis, could I ask the Minister, um, given the fact that there is an over demand for the resources she currently has available, would she continue to work with Sport NI, for example, and the boxing fraternity itself to continue to identify the gaps which are there to help the clubs get the capacity that they do need to build into the future and to secure additional funding in the future? Um, I'm happy to do that. I have continued to work and uh, liaise with the boxing community. Last week, there was an event in Andersonstown Leisure Centre, Belfast versus Spain, clubs from across all the community clubs from outside of Belfast came 
uh, to give support to that. I spoke to a lot of boxing clubs there. They fully understand the process. Aren't happy that their club isn't there yet, but certainly understand the process and supportive of it. And certainly, I'm supportive of sport and I endeavour to ensure that not only is the money there, that it's well spent, but we need to get more money in to help the boxing community. Thank you. And uh, that ends the uh, the time for questions. And we now must.